good afternoon in Europe, Africa, and all other parts of the, the world. Uh, my name is Carlos uh, Schmidt, and I'll uh, start a presentation on a fascinating topic uh, on a research the World Bank done, has done uh, together with the government of China on various issues of urbanization in China. This is the first part of the seminar series which focuses on issues of uh, urbanization and economic growth. Uh, I'm a senior economist based in Beijing and I have been working on urbanization and economic growth for over the last year here in China and my background is uh, predominantly in economics. I focus on structural reform issues in various countries. Uh, I've worked in Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, Turkey, and my current assignment is in China. So thanks for participating, and let's uh, start uh, the presentation. Let me first uh, go to the outline. Uh, I'll speak for about 25 minutes and focusing on the three very simple questions. Uh, the first question is to really understand what is the linkages between urbanization and economic growth. Is there a causation? Is there a correlation? The secondly is we'll look a little bit of China's urbanization trajectory in the past, its success, its challenges, and how it's going to uh, help uh, in future. And finally, uh, we'll look at uh, China's final objective or policy objective, which is to become a high-income country, and what needs to be done in its urbanization trajectory to facilitate that uh, transition towards the uh, high-income country. Uh, I'll go to my presentation and uh, slide now. Slides, but I, I got it. So the first question is, we'll look a little bit on uh, relationship between economic growth and urbanization. It's a fundamental question. So if you look at uh, uh, across countries, both developed and uh, developing countries, we see that urbanization is a very strong indicator of economic growth because we have seen that most countries, as they become richer, in terms of Canada, they also have a higher share of urban population. Uh, achieved high income country with urban population below 50%. Uh, and there is a lot of research done trying to understand what is a relationship, what, what is a driving force uh, for both of these structural transformation as people start to move to the cities. Because if you look at the current uh, environment, uh, majority of the growth is being driven or originates in urban areas. So cities are very important as a drivers of growth. So understanding what is behind it is very important for structural policies in an, an, uh, understanding uh, key ghost, uh, growth drivers. But at the same time, although we see that uh, higher urbanization rate is associated with a higher income levels, uh, we have seen in, in a last decades that none of the country uh, has become a rich country without uh, high levels of urbanization. At the same time, we also see, once we do econometric analysis, that more urbanization not necessarily leads to higher growth. There's actually no evidence that an increase in urbanization leads to higher growth. In other words, what we see is that urbanization and is an outcome uh, and policy actions that ask or move more people to the urban areas from rural areas not necessarily result uh, in economic growth unless there is this, uh, uh, other growth drivers that pull these people uh, to the urban areas. And then we look at a little bit in a more detail what are these drivers of uh, why people go to the urban areas. 
In essence, urbanization is a byproduct of the structural transformation as economies de develop. It's a spatial transformation. It is argued that initially uh, is a process uh, where economies transforming from agriculture-based economy to the industrial-based economy, and most of these developed industries are uh, located in the cities. And the differences in relative wages have been one of the key drivers in migration to the cities. And origin of why there's a difference in relative wages, because in urban areas, uh, labor is, in, is being employed in a more productive activities, being manufacturing, which is able to also uh, offer uh, higher wages. So what we see is that one of the key determinants of that urbanization rate increase is a difference in, in wage levels or urban-rural wage gap between rural areas and urban areas. And that has been uh, a very strong motivator why people are moving to the cities looking for, 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 for jobs. And that uh, has been one of the drivers of that urbanization, uh, which we have seen over the last uh, decades uh, across the world. At the same time, we see that although you also have a higher wages in urban areas because of the more productive uh, activities are concentrated in urban areas, we see that also there are kind of uh, disadvantages of uh, negative externalities associated with the higher cost of housing, grading congestions uh, in urban areas. Same is uh, true also for firms is because although you, you, you get an increase in, in higher productivity because of, of agglomeration economies, and I'll, I'll go into more detail what it what it's means, is also uh, firms in urban areas are also facing higher costs in terms of the higher uh, real estate and also higher uh, labor costs in terms of wages. So in an essence, what we see is that an increase in urbanization rate cannot be delinked with the structural transformation of economy, which is going from agriculture based to the sort of uh, uh, manufacturing base. And we have seen this transition not only in China, but across the different uh, economies, including the current developed economies, uh, economies of the United Kingdom, United States, also did a transition from mainly agriculture-based towards uh, industrial-based, manufacturing-based, and that was associated with the increase in urbanization rate. Uh, in essence, uh, cities, this is the linkage why cities are important drivers of that economic growth, because the way how cities are being uh, built, uh, how they are being, uh, uh, what is economic interaction between cities also determines how efficient manufacturing uh, activities and, uh, and service uh, activities in these cities uh, are. Therefore, for economic policy perspective, understanding urbanization and urban landscape is very important for structural policy uh, purposes. So this gives uh, us a little bit after that, a little bit of introduction. Uh, let's focus on how that has affected uh, China, what has been China's urbanization past, and whether that has been unique. Um, what we have seen over the last three decades, that China has uh, succeeded in implementing an impressive economic transformation from being a very poor country and succeeding to grow uh, on average about 10% uh, a year over the last uh, 30, uh, three decades. And we see that impressive economic growth has been accompanied by massive population shift from uh, rural areas to urban areas. And that is kind of uh, also a mirror of the same uh, uh, changes, where we see changes in the labor market, that uh, share of employment in service industry and the share of employment in industry is also uh, gradually increasing. And in this particular graph, uh, the, these two relationships are illustrated uh, once we look uh, at the last uh, five decades. 
And as you can see from this graph that urbanization rate uh, was about 20% uh, when China started to do its reform uh, process. So it was stagnating uh, for since 60s to late 70s, and then it gradually took off uh, in, in sub subsequent periods. So here, the key message is that this urbanization which rate increase in China is associated with a fundamental change in the structure of economy from predominantly agriculture-based to the industry-based as more people uh, move to um, <coughs> services and industry. And this process did not happen uh, on its own. Uh, there, this process was facilitated to the China's policies and actions uh, because uh, if we break down uh, these events, uh, the first major reform uh, which happened uh, was China's reforms of agriculture sector. And one of the key precondition for uh, urbanization rate to succeed and not to undermine or create pressure points is that as uh, people move from rural areas to urban areas, you need to uh, have a higher productivity in agriculture so that uh, outflow of labor from agriculture does not undermine agriculture productivity and output. And China had a very bad experience in its early urbanization uh, push uh, in 60s when too many people f uh, moved to the cities and then agriculture productivity and output uh, experienced uh, significant setback. So reform in agriculture was a first necessary step because an introduction of household responsibility system for farmers and mechanization in agriculture unleashed efficiency gains in agriculture, which resulted in excess employment, uh, which could be utilized in other areas without sacrificing output uh, in rural areas. And a second major reform, which was also gradual, was a gradual relaxation of constraints on internal migration. China is a little bit unique than other countries is that there, there were in place a significant uh, restrictions on population movement uh, from rural to urban areas. So even if you have a first reform, which is to, uh, that results in uh, excess labor in rural areas, if you do not relax constraints to that internal migration movement, nothing would happen to urbanization rate. So the second uh, policy action was gradually relaxing constraints on internal migration. It was not full relaxation, it was partial, but at least uh, it moved in a direction that allowed some of these people employed in farm activities moving to urban areas. And the third uh, reform set is that everyone is uh, widely citing uh, as China's big success is this China's industrialization and opening up uh, its uh, uh, its economy to the rest of the world. It's adopting foreign technologies, uh, attracting foreign di direct investment, and opening its economy to global markets. So the third uh, sort of a policy push was that you have excess employment that has moved to the urban areas, then you need to produce workplaces uh, in manufacturing plants, and also you, you need to find markets uh, where these products are being sold. So that was pushed by external demand. So the third set of reforms was industrialization, which is a combination of uh, attracting foreign technology, uh, modern foreign technology, opening access to the external market, and also high capital accumulation. And fourthly, uh, along the way, you had a marginal reforms which also facilitated these process, uh, gradual adjustment. These are changes to social security uh, uh, system, broadening access to the higher education, and also uh, other educational reforms, which make labor more uh, mobile to move from one area to another and also demobilizing the military further accelerated the urbanization process because uh, demobilized uh, soldiers had a preferential ability to settle in urban areas. So uh, urbanization in China, we have seen uh, it has been very rapid over the last three decades, but it was facilitated and 
uh, by set of policies uh, and therefore uh, these policies have allowed China to avoid some of the pitfalls we have seen with the rapid urbanization in other uh, other uh, developing countries such as urban slums or high levels of unemployment in urban areas. So in absolute, uh, in absolute terms, the scale of China's transformation, its urbanization is unprecedented unprecedented in human history. If you look just at the numbers, uh, currently th with 700 million urban residents, China has been the largest urban nation in human history. And also when we look at the population movements which happened over the last three decades, China's urban population increased by more than half a billion uh, people, uh, more than twice as many people as in India in the same uh, time period. And this process will continue. China's urban population expected to increase by about 250 million over the next two decades. So if we look at these numbers, these are staggering numbers. And in our research, we also saw that uh, uh, city landscapes increased very significantly over this period. Over the last uh, one decade alone, China built equivalent of 380 Manhattans in just one decade. So in absolute terms, uh, the scale of China's urbanization transformation is unprecedented in a human history. But if you look at the relative terms, which is looking at the percentage point increase in urbanization rate, we see that uh, China's urbanization rate, uh, which is an increase by 35 percentage point, has happened before in other countries too. For example, in Korea, uh, the urbanization rate or change in urbanization, which, ev which was even more rapid in the same uh, time period of three decades, it increased by uh, 30, uh, 45 percentage points. And similarly in Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, uh, an increase in urbanization rate has been also very high. So, so countries which go through rapid economic growth, it's not unprecedented that you also see an increase in urbanization rate uh, increases uh, at a very high rate. And in this graph, you also see that similar process uh, happened in the United States, United Kingdom uh, about 100 years ago. But the scale was, uh, in terms of percentages, was not as high. So having uh, seen how urbanization is very successful, the big question is, can we do that, uh, uh, continue the same policies, and whether these same policies would achieve a high income uh, status uh, for China? Because pol the big question is, if uh, policies worked in the past, why not continue those same policies? And urbanization rate would increase uh, at the same pace. What we see over, uh, in our research is that currently, uh, China's urbanization is at a crossroads. You have two uh, forces or, or two sides. Uh, on a one side, you have, um, as I demonstrated, urbanization and this rural-urban transformation has been extremely beneficial to growth. Uh, real incomes increased 16 times, and half a billion people were left out of the poverty. But at the same time, we see that a returns of that spatial transformation is gradually uh, declining. Uh, in part is declining because the gains from this spatial reallocation of labor from rural to urban areas is set to decline. The so-called Lewis turning point is once your excess labor in uh, rural areas is exhausted, then the wage pressure would start to increase more significantly in urban areas because you, you don't have that uh, excess employment which would uh, put a downboard pressure on wages, and then that would uh, undermine your competitiveness of the products. And the second major change, which is that exports can no longer be a driver of growth, which means that external demand cannot uh, be used as an engine to absorb all that manufacturing output which is produced in urban areas in China. What it means is that uh, Domestic demand factors need to be more important in driving that uh, growth. 
And thirdly, we see that growth is increasingly dependent on capital accumulation in urban areas rather than interacting all that uh, uh, capital within cities. For example, we demonstrate that most of the growth uh, we have seen is coming from accumulation of investment over the years rather than productivity uh, in urban areas. And obviously, that cannot be sustained over the long uh, periods of time because investment is also uh, becoming increasingly dependent on credit growth. So hence, the policymakers uh, understand that the current urbanization uh, policies that were in place uh, in the past might not necessarily lead to the same outcomes as in the past because the structure of the growth is also changing. So the key conclusion is that the urbanization that worked in, in the past might not work uh, in the future. Uh, given also the structural uh, changes in economic landscape, there is also stresses from the urbanization transition that China has experienced. Um, Firstly, the rapid trans urbanization which happened in China uh, had a unique uh, characteristic because not necessarily people moved uh, from rural areas to urban areas, but in often it was a case that a large share of that increase in urbanization happened uh, from the fact that the cities came to the farmers by the way of urban sprawl the cities were expanding at an uh, unprecedented scale, and sometimes farmers didn't have to move anywhere, but the cities came to, to, their, to their villages. So that has resulted in an increase in congestion and resulted in uh, economic inefficiencies, because cities are not planned in an efficient ways, but they, but they expand uncontrollably. The second uh, characteristic, which is uh, putting a pressure point, particularly in China, is, as I mentioned, uh, the issue is about gradually removing uh, mobility, uh, freedom of movement uh, within country from rural areas to, 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 this, to urban areas. And in particular in China, the system, a hukou system, limited mobility of families. Uh, of migrant workers because access to the public services was limited in urban areas for these uh, people. And as a result, urbanization of people has lagged urbanization uh, of employment, and that has created a social divisions which, are, which cannot be ignored at this stage. There are about 250 million urban residents who technically don't have a right to access public services in urban areas. That has led uh, to social divisions and potentially that undermines also economic growth. And in the industry uh, led growth uh, with high capital accumulation and investment also has been very resource intensive and has done a significant damage to environment not only at local but also at the global level. China is one of the larger emitters of uh, greenhouse uh, um, CO2, one of the larger emitters of CO2, CO2. and also uh, for those of us who live in Beijing, we see, uh, in other cities of China, we see environmental damage uh, uh, in terms of air pollution almost on a daily basis. So these uh, stress points uh, uh, indicate that the current pace of urbanization in the way how it was done in the past might not necessarily lead to the same outcomes uh, in future. And as I indicated before, the, the conditions for the next phase of urbanization is also very different because most of the growth has to originate uh, in the cities rather than from reallocation of factors of production. So given that this changing environment uh, it's important to look a little bit, uh, let, me, let me spend some time looking at uh, some of these drivers of uh, economic growth in this new urban trajectory, which means that urbanization will be driven mainly within cities and within s sectors rather than uh, uh, from reallocating factors of production across sectors. And what it means is that economic growth will be driven by productivity growth associated with a higher concentration, increased specialization, and more efficient allocation of factors of production. 
And this uh, agglomeration, specialization, and mobility, these are the three driving forces uh, which make cities a natural landscape to unleash the, the three forces on both supporting both supply and demand side. And let me explain a little bit uh, of these three forces. One is agglomeration, which is, means that economic concentration is focused in a very narrow area, and that agglomeration allows to, uh, to uh, shared knowledge because uh, very highly educated people are, are concentrated in a very uh, densely populated areas. That allows for labor uh, matching and pooling, which increases human capital and that interaction. And also on the demand side, higher agglomeration allows to, to increase uh, consumption and social amenities associated with the higher densities. Some of the consumer products and services are very expensive or high, very high fixed costs, like for example, production of opera or cultural events. Uh, so for these events, uh, it's higher agglomeration or higher density of uh, population is more conducive, and that's why we, we, we see global cities, global high agglomerations also being uh, centers of these consumer and social and cultural amenities uh, that are associated with the high density. The second uh, aspect in the cities, which is very important, is also specialization. If you look at the, what has happened in, in, in China in terms of uh, specialization in manufacturing, we have seen that cities where uh, some of the cities were highly specialized in a, a unique uh, uh, production of unique products. Uh, we, we, we see in the cities that produce only buttons, we see in cities that specialize only in producing keyboards that has allowed to to utilize economies of scale that has allowed to increase its uh, competitiveness and uh, which allowed uh, to maintain uh, an increase in net exports. Uh, in urban areas, uh, not only in manufacturing but also in, in provision of uh, services, specialization is very important. We see that cities at the global scale have been very specialized. We see that insurance is highly specialized in a few cities in the United States, for example, mutual funds are highly specialized in Boston, for example. Financial services are highly specialized in a few cities in the world. So we see high level of specialization in these urban areas. And the third major factor which allows to unleash the productivity growth is importance of mobility and connectivity. It is free mobility of factors of production, uh, both capital, land, and labor. The cities that are best connected to the markets and also to the factor markets are best uh, suited to unleash uh, these uh, productivity growth that are associated with the matching uh, right resources at the right time. On the demand side, uh, maintaining that mobility and connectivity also means that uh, investment rate, especially in public services, needs to, uh, needs to increase. And for example, in China, we have seen some of these factors played a very important role. For example, uh, highway system or high-speed uh, train system uh, has increased mobility of people uh, moving to the cities and also uh, moving to the making the labor market also uh, more f flexible. So these are the key drivers of economic growth, especially they're becoming more important as countries becoming middle income on trying to become a high income. We have not seen the globally competitive city which has not fully utilized these three forces, agglomeration, specialization, and also mobility and connectivity. And I'll spend a few minutes showing that actually what China's biggest challenge is, in, is the biggest challenge is in precisely in these three areas, is uh, its agglomeration uh, economy in a sense that its densities. Also, we have seen an increase in urbanization rate. We have seen that urban densities have been falling in China, which means that the land area of cities is 
expanding at a much, much higher rate than a population increase. So that's contributing to these um, urban sprawls, uh, etc. Transportation congestion. So that city is not very efficient in terms of uh, for in terms of business environment or or, or, or doing uh, your business, especially in services. If you have to spend uh, hours commuting from one point of the uh, part of the city to the next. And in part, uh, the second uh, interesting observation which we have seen is that um, if we look at the Gini coefficients of urban population uh, cities across countries, we see that usually there is this one city or few cities that dominate uh, uh, economic geography of different countries. Uh, with the three notable exceptions, Russia, Ukraine, and China, we see that uh, where we don't see one or two cities dominating uh, the economic geography landscape, and in part is is a result of um, the central pa planning heritage, where cities were not uh, planned or developed according to the market forces, but also uh, by uh, by um, by administrative uh, fiat, and also the three uh, countries uh, both. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, and China as a similar characteristic of having institutional uh, constraints to the uh, domestic mobility in, in, in the past, uh, both uh, in the times of Soviet uh, Union and in China in terms of the, its hook or reform. On a second uh, aspect, which also we, we, we see that there is a lack of spe specialization in China in high value added uh, services, uh, what we would want to see that in these high agglomeration cities, Shanghai and Beijing, we see, we want to see that these cities, once they become richer and larger, they're becoming more specialized in high value added services. Uh, uh, but we see that the process of uh, uh, concentrating in high value added services is rather slow. And in part, the process is very slow because of these large cities still maintain a very high manufacturing base uh, within uh, the urban areas. And this particular graph shows distribution of economic concentration in manufacturing comparing to the United States. In the United States, we see that manufacturing is predominantly concentrated in smaller cities uh, where the cost of the land is arguably cheaper. But in China, we see that the cities of 10 to 15 million are still highly concentrated in, in manufacturing. And third factor in terms of mobility, as I indicated, um, these constraints in mobility have resulted in the fact that the urbanization rate in China currently, which is at 50 percent, is <coughs> excuse me, somewhat lower than in other countries at similar level of uh, GDP when they were at the level of the GDP of China. And this particular graph sh shows you uh, uh, China's urbanization rate, which is currently at uh, at a fifty percent, other countries have achieved that uh, urbanization rate when they were uh, their income levels were were, were uh, somewhat lower. Um, and as a, as a policy conclusion, what you you want to to see is what is what I showed you is an outcome. And one of the reasons why we see this lack of economic concentration, lack of specialization in high value added services, and lack of mobility is distortions in a factor market which have undermined efficiency of that urbanization. We see significant distortions in the land markets which result in a falling densities in a sense that uh, local governments rely on land conversions to finance uh, their infrastructure, which means that they have to grow. Uh, horizontally rather than vertically. We also see that capital market distortions have slowed specialization because uh, large enterprises still have larger access, higher, much better access to the capital markets, and then small and medium enterprises are not uh, growing as uh, fast, which is usually an engine of innovations and innovative service-based uh, growth. 
And finally, the frictions in the labor market have slowed income convergence, which has undermined consumption growth in urban areas. So in a summary, uh, what we have seen that China has been very successful in its urbanization drive uh, to become a middle-income country. But in order to become a high-income country, China will have to address some of these distortions in a factor market, which has led its urbanization trajectory a little bit of stray, in particular causing some of these stresses, which will undermine its economic growth. And in the next presentation, which will next seminar, the Cho Ching Go will go in more detail in that reform agenda, what needs to be done to address these factor markets. Thank you. Uh, this is the uh, end of the presentation, and I uh, Okay, there is this one question. Um, um, China can be the biggest producer. Is it possible for other countries to achieve the same rate of urbanization in the same way? Um, for other countries, you can achieve the same way in relative terms as in China if you are replicating the same development path from low income to middle income country. And uh, as a matter of fact, China has not been unique. Uh, this process, uh, which is transformation from agriculture based to the manufacturing, a lot of countries have done. And that's a blueprint for first stage of economic development to become a me uh, middle income country. So yes, uh, other countries can do that. Will you become the largest producer in the world? Not necessarily, because in a sense, China has also its advantage in terms of its size. OK, so there's a question of um, about China's hukou, uh, hukou system. Are Chinese officials planning to finally re re uh, constrain to inter internal migration? Um, Yes, uh, the government is has announced uh, reforms of hukou system, uh, gradual reforms over the uh, over the next few years, and the process will be gradual. In a sense, first restrictions will be removed uh, into small cities, but then again, large and medium-sized cities. Uh, these restrictions uh, to mobility will remain. And these restrictions to mobility are linked to restrictions to access to uh, public services. And th that is very much linked to uh, the second interlinked problem is fiscal issues of the local governments. Because in a current environment, uh, due to the, the setup of the public finance system, uh, local governments don't have a lot of their own revenues or ability to tax uh, incomes and also the consumption of these uh, uh, migrants. Uh, uh, but they have expenditure responsibilities to provide uh, public services in terms of education and health care. So you have this uh, mismatch that they have very high expenditure responsibilities but little revenue generating abilities. And in that sense, an increase in population uh, of the city, and particularly uh, to the city which has a higher level of service provision in terms of education, like Shanghai uh, and Beijing. So that's a challenge. And that's uh, um, uh, is directly linked uh, with the issue of public finance. So the hukou reform is also very much linked to the issues of addressing these intergovernmental relationship of expenditure realignment. Uh, there's a question. China is facing a lot of urbanization challenges. Which do you think will be the hardest to tackle? I think the hardest uh, to tackle is, uh, let's see, uh, for policy challenges, uh, what do you need to address these factor market uh, uh, distortions. Uh, uh, and one of the hardest uh, challenges in addressing these factor markets is, is addressing distortions in the land markets, because this usually is the most complex and most sensitive, uh, because one of the 
particular uh, developments in China is that a large, uh, significant amount of, of financing done in these uh, cities in terms of investment uh, was done uh, from converting farmland to urban land and auctioning off that uh, to developers. So in a compensation to farmers uh, for these land leases was usually uh, smaller than the market value uh, what you, you, once you do. And addressing that, uh, unf uh, that distortion is very significant because that involves addressing issues of communal properties in rural areas and also uh, uh, addressing the issues uh, with uh, property rights. So that's always is very uh, uh, complex. So the hukou system in Beijing, uh, it seems that they are applying more strict policies against outsiders. Yes, I mean, Beijing is one of the cities uh, which is uh, rich uh, and in terms of uh, its ability of provide also the better quality of the public services than, for example, in other cities. Beijing is also a city which is growing in terms of the employment opportunities. So obviously, a lot of people would want to uh, come to uh, to seek these employment uh, opportunities in Beijing. But at the same time, given that these uh, uh, imbalances in local government expenditure and revenue assignments, uh, Beijing uh, uh, local government do not want to give uh, all these migrants right to the hukou, which is to access to the public services. So that's again uh, is the big challenge in urban, uh, uh, large urban metropolises in China. Yes, the constraint is, is because they are not uh, able to, to provide social services, not, not so much social protection, but also uh, uh, access to education and, uh, and uh, health uh, at the, in uh, urban areas for everybody. Because again, this is uh, due to uh, expenditure and revenue mismatch between local and central governments. Yes, uh, th there's a question about uh, comparing uh, what happened in India in terms of uh, its structural changes and uh, whether India jumped from industrialization of services in a big way. Um, yes and no. Uh, in part, I think there are a lot of similarities between India and China. I think uh, one of these similarities is that you had this population transformation going uh, towards urban areas. In uh, in China, it was uh, more driven by policy. For example, in urban areas, you had these top-down policies developing these large industries, which did absorb absorb a lot of labor force. So the authorities were very careful uh, in a sense that once people moved to the cities, when they move, that there are jobs for these people to see. In other countries, what we have seen is that a lot of people move to the cities uh, for seeking opportunities for jobs, but maybe not necessarily all these jobs were there. They were maybe lower skilled. There were not a lot of uh, uh, manufacturing jobs available. So the, 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 these are the, the differences between uh, uh, China. Uh, China and, uh, 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 and India. So, so there's a question: Is there evidence that since urbanization is growing, land produced in a fewer hands, uh, whether there is this uh, monopoly uh, in a food production? Uh, one of the peculiarity, uh, one of the, the the issues in China is that uh, uh, because as uh, as I mentioned, this land is uh, 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 communal uh, property often by farmers. So we see a lot of these uh, 
small smart farming communities and there is a lack of sort of economies of scale of these uh, uh, pooling some of these land plots uh, in a larger uh, larger land plots which would allow to increase productivity and economies of, of scale so uh, we don't see for that reason we don't see kind of a concentration of uh, economic wealth in agriculture yeah And one of the policy conclusions is that we want to see more of that higher uh, economies of scale in agriculture. Yeah. Uh, whether you have a master plan for organization uh, or, or let a market, I, I think you need to let the market forces determine where the cities will be and for example where the, the size of the cities but at the same time you have to be also manage the process very carefully in terms of urban planning and I think uh, in, in the next seminar series we will focus on these urban planning issues which are very important also to, to make sure that this process is very um, uh, in, in, in done in the proper way too and then uh, but at the same time, uh, one, it's impossible to plan cities from scratch. There needs to be kind of necessary conditions or market forces where cities uh, are being built. Okay. Okay, the final question is uh, about the central government is running the process. How do you think China can apply market forces? I think that's the biggest, uh, one of the biggest challenges because one of the policy conclusions that the role of the government will have to change are the market forces will have to make a uh, more stronger role in, in, in particularly in allocating these factors of production, labor, and land and capital and then once you have a market forces allocating where the labor will be is also going to affect the landscape of the cities which cities will grow and which cities will not grow and once you have these market forces uh, then the city planning is going to make sure that these people uh, who are or uh, people who have moved to these particular cities the, the, the urban landscape e e e is made in conducive uh, to uh, livability of these cities. Yes, I agree that urbanization facilitates economic growth by utilizing labor surpluses uh, that were in uh, rural areas. That's correct. So that's uh, the main uh, driving force. Uh, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition for economic growth because you also need uh, a better use of that labor surplus found in rural areas. What is effective urbanization level for less? Uh, that's a challenging uh, question because in a sense once you have less less populated areas or states, particularly island states, uh, that is a very uh, uh, more difficult uh, to make uh, uh, everybody, for, for example, for natural reasons uh, or geographical reasons, landscape, you might have people spread out in a small populated areas uh, in a farming. It, it, it not always uh, y you can have a sort of determine an optimal uh, urbanization rate for that particular, uh, 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 these places. Uh, on a corporate farming, uh, I'm, I've not, 
what we have seen the process that it, it is becoming a sort of a, a, a We have seen evidence that it's moving to the large scale, but given that you have these frictions in a land market, we still see that scope of increase in productivity in ag agriculture is quite significant in terms of uh, scale of agriculture. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, for participating and thanks for your questions.